it's a test of historical contingency. When we look at the living realm today, is it characterized as a contingent realm? Uh, do we see any evidence in which we would s interpret it as evolution having repeated itself when we look at things from an evolutionary perspective? And so what I'm doing here, in essence, is I'm testing the mechanism for evolution, but I'm not doing this directly, but I'm doing it indirectly. If evolution's mechanism is true, if historical contingency, which defines evolution's mechanism, is ultimately responsible for the living realm today, then we should see a certain pattern. We predict a certain pattern, non-repeatability. However, if we see another pattern, that calls into question the validity of, ev of evolution. So this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and, and this is where the concept of biological convergence becomes so important. Now, we are poised at a time in which the techniques are available within the evolutionary biology community to really put this idea to the test in a comprehensive way. And in order to understand why that's the case, I need to very briefly introduce you to the concepts of something called phylogenetics. And again, many of you are probably familiar with this, but this area of evolutionary biology is the process by which evolutionary biologists attempt to define the pathways of evolution. And, and the techniques are actually fairly complex techniques. Tremendous amount of debate in the literature about the methodologies involved in phylogenetics, but the concept is relatively simple. Basically, if you take a group of organisms, you can, you can group them into groups. You can classify them or cluster them into groups. And then smaller groups can be grouped into larger groups, and those larger groups, in turn, can be grouped into even larger groups. This is called a nested hierarchy. And then once this is done, evolutionists, in essence, interpret this in the form of an evolutionary tree, where they say that group within grouping within grouping is explicable through, essentially, descent with modification from a common ancestor, where the groups that are in existence today represent the tips of the evolutionary tree, and those groups that cluster together within a larger group must have shared a common ancestor, and that's represented as a node in the evolutionary tree. And you can repeat that process and work your way back to uh, uh, the most recent common ancestor with respect to the particular system you're at, er, looking at. Well, the way in which evolutionists traditionally have built these evolutionary trees is using something called morphological phylo phylogenetics. And this is essentially using anatomical features or physiological features to build evolutionary trees, looking for similarities and differences among the organisms, and then, again, interpreting it within an evolutionary context. Well, in recent years, another approach has emerged to the forefront, arguably so, within evolutionary biology, and this is the use of DNA sequences to build evolutionary trees, and this is called molecular phylogenetics. And the idea here is that organisms that have similar DNA sequences, according to the evolutionary mindset, must have shared a common ancestor much more recently than organisms that have a large difference in their genetic makeup. And what's going on now is that evolutionary biologists are essentially taking morphological phylogenies and imposing the molecular phylogenies on top of them. Or they're taking molecular phylogenies and they're mapping morphological features onto them. And this allows us to, to probe as to whether or not evolution can repeat itself. This is the way in which we can put this idea to the test. And what do you discover? Well, you discover, for example, a phenomena known as repeated evolution. I've seen this referred to as repeated evolution in the literature. And this is a growing phenomena, or the phenomena is becoming increasingly recognized within the evolutionary biology community. And what I mean by repeated evolution is it looks as if species that should have had, that are morphologically indistinguishable had independent evolutionary origins. Now, the evolutionary term is that instead of a particular species being monophyletic, it's either diphyletic or polyphyletic. What did I just say there? It's, it's, Mono, mono means single. So something, a species that's monophyletic is a species that had a single evolutionary origin. And, and presumably, uh, individuals that are morphologically identical or indistinguishable should belong to the same species and should have a single evolutionary origin because evolution doesn't repeat. Well, what's being recognized is that species that were thought to be monophyletic based on morphology turn out to be diphyletic Di meaning two, having two separate origins, or polyphyletic, meaning having many separate origins. Independent evolutionary events that generate identical organisms. And this is called repeated evolution. 
And here is just a few examples that I've stumbled across. This is not based on an exhaustive search of the literature. These are just a few examples I've stumbled across, uh, examples of repeated evolution that have just recently